Welcome to FaceTime Fly Fishing. I am your host, Eric Straub. Glad you could join us today. We've got a great show lined up. Uh, I expect we're going to have lots of comments and opinions, and uh, I'm sure I'll get lots of email through the week. But uh, if you're at work, try to look busy. Uh, for the next 40 minutes, we've got lots of stuff to discuss. If you're at home, sit back and enjoy the show. Uh, you can be a part of the show. Uh, use the question answer toggle with the Google Plus. You can text me at 814-05-4568. You can also send me an email at epstraup at gmail.com. So the text is 814-505-4568 and email me at epstraup at gmail.com. Last week, we were at the Lancaster Show. Uh, it was fantastic. We had a great crowd. Um, lots of people there. Sunday was a little bit slow, mostly because of the weather forecasters that were uh, promising the end of the world, but there is a shortage now of milk and bread in the Lancaster area. <laughs> but at any rate, it was a uh, it was a great show. Got to see lots of friends and uh, have some good conversation. Our latest videos. Uh, last two videos that came out since we last spoke on this show was the was Kevin Compton's Blue Wing Olive uh, Emerger, which was a soft tackle. Great, great pattern. Uh, and mine uh, that I tied was a Granum Sparkle Emerger uh, designed by Gary LaFontaine. It is a terrific pattern. Uh, got lots of good comments. And I've already gotten an email for today's show. <laughs> Please discuss. Jeff Biller, how are you, Jeff? Do fishermen carry way too many patterns instead of presenting the fly properly? We, we are going to go right down that path. <laughs> so glad you could join us, folks. Sit back. It's going to be a great show. Those two flies that I uh, just discussed that we released last week, we are getting ready to go into the hatch season. And we're tying patterns that we're going to need to imitate specific bugs uh, in specific situations. And it leads us right into our topic today, which I have already gotten since I sent the invitations out for the show. I've already gotten emails and text messages and all sorts of things about this. It's really a hot, a hot ticket item. Um, but it's what fly to use during the hatch for those transitional times. Um, being told there's a slight delay here. I want to try something, folks, if you'll excuse me for just a second. I want to see if that's any better. Last week on the broadcast, we had a delay from my voice with the picture and the and the sound, and I'm not sure if it's because I'm using a, a different camera. So I'm going to try that and see if uh, if that works any better. But back to our topic, uh, we're discussing transitional patterns, and, and I get asked all the time when we're on the screen, how do you know whether to fish a nymph or a, an emerger or a dry fly. Uh, obviously the spinners are something you're always looking for. And this is one of those things that I think uh, you know every situation is different. And we're going to get into a couple of variables that we're always going to have when we're on the water uh, before we really get into the meat of that discussion. One is water temperature. This makes a huge difference. Um, and it's really what separates tailwaters and freestone streams and limestone streams. One of the really interesting comments that I got this morning once I sent the invitation out was from a, an entomologist that I know who said, are you going to discuss the difference in rise forms between freestone fish and limestone fish? And my response to that was, um, we're probably going to disagree on some things in this show. And my, my normal uh, course of action anytime I throw my opinion out is that I just make, make it known to everyone that this is my opinion. It's based on 
my fishing experience, um, and, and that's that's pretty much it. Now, what I have had the opportunity to do, in fact, I did it this past weekend in Lancaster, was I sat down with Jason Randall for about two hours. Jason is the guy, if you saw my video on Somerset, I interviewed him about his book called Moving Waters. He actually has a trilogy of three books that are all on moving waters, trout behavior, and how they feed. And he comes at it from a scientific perspective. I come at it just from a fishing perspective. Um, so we ended up in, with the same conclusions. And it really inspired us. And we're going to actually work on a project together this summer and hopefully have it to be able to present it to everyone next fall. But at any rate, I'm getting off subject. Water temperature has a huge effect on how the fish rise and how the insects behave. And so that's one thing that we've got to keep in consideration. I'll get into that a little more as we go. Weather. Um, weather can have a big effect. Anybody that fishes the sulfurs uh, in our neck of the woods in central PA knows that uh, when it's really hot and dry, you can pretty much plan on a late hatch. If it's cold and rainy, uh, you can get a hatch in the middle of the day. It can make things fantastic. Insect behavior. You have to understand the insect that you're fishing for. Um, in other words, you've got, to, you've got to know what that insect typically does. If it's an isonychia, those, those insects tend to swim towards the, the bank and like, they like to crawl out on rocks like stoneflies do. Um, granums. Granums actually pupate on the bottom of the stream and they come up through the water as, a, as, a, as an adult. So those things, those things matter. Insect density. That's another issue that, you know, it's something that you've always got to be mindful of. Is it a really, really heavy hatch? You know, heavy hatches will tend to pull the fish to certain areas. Uh, they take advantage of, of every opportunity they get. And, of course, current. The type of current that we're fishing in. And uh, I'm going to expand on all these things uh, as, as we go. So before I continue, like I said, this is my normal disclaimer. This is just my opinion. Um, and as I said, I got the chance to, to sit down with Jason Randall. And it was great because he kind of told me why I, I thought all the things I did. You know, I, I see these things on the water all the time, and I come to these conclusions, but it was really neat to have someone with a science background, he's an animal behavior scientist, um, and to have him be able to explain to me why those things were occurring uh, was, was really neat. So I'm excited to uh, move forward with Jason and, and work on this project. It's going to be awesome. It's going to have a lot of video, both underwater and above water, and uh, we're going to try to prove some of the things I'm, I'm saying right now. Number one thing when you're on the water is trust your eyes. You've got to observe what's happening. Um, lots of people see a rise form and automatically they assume it's something. Uh, for example, uh, they see a splashy rise. Most guys that I know assume when they see a splashy rise that that means that that fish is eating an emerger. It could be. It could also be that the fish is deep. Now there's there's several different types of rises. There's there's that splashy rise. Sometimes you'll see a bulge where the fish never really breaks the surface, but you'll just see a bulge. Sometimes you'll you'll notice the tail on all the rises. Uh, and of course you've always got the sipping trap. So you've got to watch these things and watch exactly how the fish are responding. If you can see an adult uh, insect on the water, watch the adults. See if they're being eaten. Okay, But don't assume because you see a certain type of rise form that you can associate that rise form with a food item. 
Okay, and, and the reason I'm saying that, we have to remember something. Trout are the most vulnerable when they come up to the surface. So they don't want to rust. So what happens is a lot of times, depending on the food availability, they may be eating surface flies. They might be eating duns, but they might be sitting deep. So if they're sitting deep, and they're taking surface flies, when they come up and go back down, they're going to make a splash. Okay, And I see that all the time on the little juniata. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Believe it or not, I'm still battling this cold. It's unbelievable. I asked my wife, how long is this going to last? And she said, four months. <laughs> so you'll have to pardon my coughing occasionally. So the trout do not want to rise. So I'm going to give you something to think about. When you see these rises, when you're seeing surface activity with trout, instead of trying to associate a, a stage of food that you think they might be eating, associate or try to associate their depth. Think about where the fish is depth-wise. If you can't see the fish, it's probably pretty deep. Um, that's how you want to think. I sort of have the conclusion that most quote unquote emergers are eaten deep. We don't see those flies being eaten. It doesn't make sense to me that a trout would eat one of those transitional stage bugs all the way at the surface when he can have them down at the bottom. If they could feed all day on the bottom, they would. So when I'm, when I'm starting to see trout on the surface, I'm thinking surface activity. Now, I might fish an emerger or a nymph or a dry fly or even a soft tackle, but I'll fish it up in the film. I'll fish it dry, essentially. Because if I'm seeing something from that fish that they're coming up, that's a good indication that they're they're up there, obviously. Now, remember, I said I said water temperature is a big issue. Keep this in the back of your mind. Cold water has a higher viscosity than warm water. So what happens is, when insects emerge, they come up and they get stuck in that meniscus. So one constant that we have about trout that we all know is that they will never expend more energy than they take in. So they're going to find food where it is most congregated. When insects are rising and they're getting stuck in that meniscus, then they're going to focus on that and that's where they're going to take their food. It doesn't mean that they're going to sit up high in the current or just under the surface to eat them. So consequently, depending on their depth in the current, we're going to see different types of rise forms. But they're still eating food in the surface. So that gives you a clue as to where you have to fish that. I see guys all the time, I think they really overdo. And to your point, Jeff, we come up with all of these different crazy emerger patterns. And we fish them all through the column. And it doesn't mean you won't catch a fish on them. Believe me, when the fish are feeding, they're pretty opportunistic, and if they get the opportunity to eat, they will. But in order to understand them, I think it's important that we understand what makes the things that we see happen. And I think when we've got cold water, which is very often the case early in the season, um, and I can think of the, the granums is a great example. Normally, it occurs in the beginning to the middle of April. The water temps are still cold. They're in the low 50s. And what happens is those bugs, the granum, pupates on the bottom of the stream in the case and comes up. That bug gets caught right in the surface. And so while it makes sense on many levels to fish an emerger um, at all levels because of the way that that bug hatches, if you're seeing rising activity, focus on the surface because they're coming up there for a reason. 
There's bugs in that surface, though. The other thing is early in the hatch. Uh, I think of the sulfurs. I always have a hard time getting my clients not to fish to those first risers. You see the, the early rising fish that will happen anywhere, usually within an hour of when the hatch is going to start. You'll see that occasional splashy rise. Everyone assumes that those fish are eating in a merger. I'm not sure that they are eating in a merger, but what I am sure of is that there's not enough bug life to draw the fish up to the surface to leave themselves vulnerable to get food. So what they're doing is they're staying deep. So when they come up, take the food and go back down, they cause a splash. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that they are eating an emerging insect. So I maintain that most of the time you're going to find trout in two places, either at the surface, eating on the surface, or you're going to find them eating on the bottom. That transitional stuff that's in the middle rarely happens. It does happen, but it's not where you should start. You should start at either the bottom or the surface and then work your way into the middle. If you're not having success in either one of those places, you have to remember how the trout sees too. Uh, we've had enough studies now, I think that it's it's pretty conclusive that the deeper a trout is, the larger area he can see on the surface. So a, a trout sees like a traffic cone. So if you put a, a cone on the bottom, it comes up and the deeper the fish is, the bigger surface area he can see on the surface. So that tells us a couple of things. Um, number one is that they are probably focused further ahead of them when they're deeper. So we have to throw our fly further ahead of the fish. If you've ever seen them during the spinner fall, when the, the trout, because there's so many flies, on the surface. The trout will suspend just under the surface and all you'll see is a little dimple. They'll just, I call it pack manning. They'll just keep coming up like this and eating. They can't see very far in front of them when they do that. All they see is a mirrored surface. In order for them to see further, they've got to go deeper. So when you have this situation where you're getting these rises because the fish are coming up from, from depth, that means you've got to throw your pattern further ahead of where you saw that rise. The fish are keyed in a little further out. That's another reason for them to stay deep. This will very often happen in the beginning of the hatch when there's not a huge amount of bugs on the water. When you've just got the occasional fly on the water, they will sit deep and they'll watch way out ahead of them. So I've seen that happen too where the angler throws, you know, he sees that splashy rise, he throws the pattern where he normally would during the middle of the hatch when, they're, when the fish are up a little bit, uh, and the, the fish never sees those flies. So you've got to get that imitation out further ahead of, of where the fish is stationed. The other thing that matters here, that really matters, is current. Um, Flat current is a whole different ball game than, than current that's a little bit choppy. If they're sitting deep in flat current, which is a, a good possibility, they can see a long way off. Uh, they also don't have to fight much current to come up uh, to take an insect. That leads me into the, the, the difference between rise forms between, say, your classic spring creeks uh, we'll say uh, the Latorte, if anyone's ever fished the Latorte, and a freestone stream. Um, the Latorte and those classic spring creeks, first of all, they have tons of food in them. I mean tons of food. There is always something in the drift that the fish can eat. Often also that a lot of that food is very small. And so 
the fish can be extremely picky and they're not going to move very far for food. Now, with all of that food comes target identification. Now, this is a study that Jason Randall pointed me to from the 1960s, and this was so interesting to me, and I'm sure that everyone here can relate to this. I am going to get a copy of this, and I'm going to do an entire show on it, because I think it's uh, it, it, it proves a lot of what most of us know just from fishing. But the study indicated that the more times a trout sees a target, the more honed in on uh, it, on on the target it gets, and the more accurate it has to be in order for the trout to eat it. This was interesting to me because we can all relate to. Uh, we'll use the sulfur hatch as an example because it lasts so long. It's a three-week long hatch. Catching trout in the beginning of the sulfur hatch compared to catching trout at the end of the sulfur hatch is a whole different ball game, particularly with spinners. And <clears throat> this study proves that because the trout see so many of one thing that they get really honed in on. It's not intelligence, it's nothing like that. It's just that they see the same thing over and over again and they start to get pickier with the characteristics of it. I think you have this situation in spring creeks, in these classic spring creeks like the Latorte, in that these fish constantly see these, imitate these patterns, these uh, you know, macro invertebrates and shrimp and things like that. They constantly see them. And so you have to be pretty dead on with your imitation. More importantly, you have to be dead on with your drift. So anything that's out of the normal to those fish is blaringly obvious. And so I think if you have a difference in spring creek rise forms as opposed to freestone stream rise forms, that would probably be it. In that, that the takes are very subtle, they're relaxed, they they know exactly what they're eating, and they're very discriminatory. So uh, that could be that could be a major reason for that. So in conclusion with this, concentrate in two areas when you're in the hatch. Concentrate either on the bottom or on the surface. Now I maintain that most hatches, uh, most mayfly hatches, if you're seeing surface activity, you have two choices that are very, very good. You can float a nymph. Or you can, or you can float a dun pattern, an adult pattern, for the insect that you're hatching. You're going to win in most of those situations. All of these exotic emerger patterns that we have, of course, they'll work at, at different times. But if you're seeing surface activity, you know that the fish are concentrated there. So, <clears throat> most of the emerger patterns that we have have things coming out of the out of the wing case and things like that. For a trout to be sitting deep, looking up, uh, they're going to see a nymph. And so think about that. Um, of, of course, you have insects that mature on the bottom and they come up as a, as an adult. They come up through the surface. That's where you want to concentrate on your bugs. You you want to understand the hatch that you're fishing. For example, the granums, as I mentioned before. They pupate in the case on the bottom, and they come up through the surface, through the water, as an adult. So soft tackles are a great imitation for those. Um, the other thing, we tied the, uh, the La Fontaine this week. That is a great pattern. I said in the video uh, that I took a picture one time right at my feet of a granum, granum stuck in the surface film. And then you could literally see the gas bubble around its body. It was really neat. And if I could figure out a way to get a photo into my my uh, video program, I would have stuck it in there. But really valuable. Concentrate, put the fly in the surface when you're seeing rise forms. And see how that works for you. 
observe. You've really got to watch. Watch what's happening on the water. Find the depth of the fish. See if you can determine how deep the fish are that you're, that you're fishing to. Another thing about knowing the hatch. If you can understand how the bugs hatch, that is going to be a huge clue into figuring out how to fish the hatch. Sulfurs. Some of them do hatch under the surface and come up as adults. That's one reason the soft tackle works so well. The other reason the soft tackle works so well is so often the adult gets onto the surface and it gets tumbled. It'll come down through ripples and it's just it's all over the place. A soft tackle is a great imitation of that. But I can tell you that last year I tied a floating nymph on the on the uh, website. Last year I caught more fish in the sulfur hatch on that floating nymph than I did on sulfur duns. So for what that's worth, um, those nymphs 90% of them hatch right at the surface. They are extremely vulnerable in that stage, and I think the trout really key on that. You don't need an emerger, in my opinion, on that. You just need a nymph. Grease a nymph and float it right in the surface. Uh, it works really well. So if you're seeing rises, you know where to start. Start at the surface. Uh, if you're not catching anything there, go to the bottom. <laughs> If you're not a member of FaceTime, go to www.ericstroutflyfishing.com. We do two videos a week, uh, all instructional in nature, lots of tying videos. I cannot wait. Uh, when I get back this weekend, we are going to be on the water, and for the next several weeks, we are going to have a lot of videos from the water, working on technique, getting ready for the hatches. Um, but you can become a member of FaceTime Fly Fishing. It's $10 a month for two videos a week. Excuse me. We also do um, interviews with lots of people. I have got lots of guests lined up uh, for the upcoming season. Can't wait. I'm also putting together a school. And I don't have the details on this yet. I would be um, very grateful to hear from you on this. Send me an email at epstraup at gmail.com. What I want to do is a school on specific hatches. And it'll be an evening type deal where we will discuss, it'll probably be three programs just like this, where we will discuss all the ins and outs of a specific hatch. For example, um, before the granums come off, maybe the first week of April, we'll do a three-night event where we will get together just like this, same format, and discuss randoms, patterns, tactics, leaders, the whole deal. What to look for, uh, water temperatures, sunlight, things like that. So I'd like to do that for several different hatches. The granums, the sulfurs, isonychias, blueing olives, uh, trichos. So um, let me know what you think of that. I think it's a great idea. I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, so join FaceTime. You've got to be a FaceTime member to do it. So uh, it's 10 bucks a month. You can buy a three-month, a six-month, or a 12-month membership. Uh, we're glad to have you, and we take suggestions every week uh, about programming ideas. <clears throat> so, Jeff, I, I hope I answered your question. I think we do carry too many patterns with us. Um, and not to say that you can ever really have too many patterns, but it should never cloud your thought. So I guess what I'm trying to, I guess in summation, what I'm trying to, to, to convey here is when you're seeing rising fish, they are obviously feeding at the surface. Don't think about mid-level. Focus on the surface. Stick your fly in the surface. Get a good drift. If you're not moving them and you think they're coming from a lot of depth, Cast the fly further ahead of the fish, um, but for them to for them to be surfacing, they are putting themselves at great risk. So there's a reason that they're doing that. One other tip I'll give you: um, 
and since the Granums are coming up, we'll, we'll use that as a good example. That is, a, that is an event. That all happens at one time. It's much like the sulfurs. I never start fishing until they really start hatching. Um, it, is, it is one of the hardest things to do. I will sit my clients uh, on, on the bank and I'll say, we're going to wait, we're going to wait, and you'll see a couple of fish rise here and there. But I'll tell you what happens. When you get out there and you start fishing, you move those fish. And if you don't move them, they will set up right where they want to be. Now, one thing I will do is when I think I'm within 15 or 20 minutes of the hatch occurring, I will move my guys into position without fishing. We will simply move in there with causing the least amount of disturbance possible, and we'll wait. And I wait until I see a fish that's consistently coming up, and then we'll target them. So that's one thing that you can do. Uh, I had a, a great... Uh, a, example of that with one of our members, uh, Ron Garrett. Hope you don't mind me talking about this, Ron, but I had Ron and his son for the Sulphurs last year. We had a phenomenal day, and we were waiting for the, the hatch to happen at night, and I, I put them both in position, and I told Ron not to fish, and he started fishing, and I told his son not to fish, and he didn't, and uh, his son had fish rising right in front of him, and, and caught just about every one of them through the evening, and, and Ron really struggled. So you, you can move those fish by causing disturbance, and, and it's, it's not worth it. Just wait, especially when you know the hatch is going to happen. Um, just wait on it. Too many patterns, paralysis by analysis. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Um, if you never tied an emerger pattern, and you fish nothing but nymphs and your adult dries for 99% of the hatches, and you just fish that nymph in the right place, um, you do fine. I can almost guarantee you that. I also had another comment uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to some guys about drift. You know, and, and don't assume when, you're, when you have a pattern on, don't assume that you, made the wrong, that you have the wrong pattern. So much of it is drift. I mean, I think we all know that. Um, I said to some guys last week or two weeks ago at the uh, show in Cranberry, PA, if you want to guarantee yourself more fish, all you have to do is lengthen your tippet by two feet. I guarantee you you'll catch more fish because you're going to get a better drift. Now, you might not be able to control it. It might not be as fun. But you will get a better drift, and uh, that is so often the key to what we're doing. We have a tendency to automatically assume that we've got the wrong pattern on when we don't catch a fish, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so I can't stress that enough. Really, uh, really know that you've got to have a good drift, and so many times it's not the pattern. Focus on that drift. Getting lots of comments on this. This is great. Um, rule number one, always listen to your guide. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Sometimes we don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll point that out. There are times when uh, you know, I don't have a clue what they want. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, that's uh, another point. Always be versatile. But start at the top and the bottom, and if you're not moving them there, then go into that intermediate area. Um, then start doing some different things. Swing some flies. Maybe fish a soft tackle. And you may find them in there. I'm just saying that most of the time, if you're seeing surface activity, they are feeding at the surface, and uh, use that. Use that knowledge. Use your eyes, not your intellect. I mean, we have a, a tendency to really overthink a lot of things. This week, uh, Thursday night, I'm going over to Joe Humphrey's house. We're having venison roast and potatoes and asparagus, I think. And then Friday morning at 6 o'clock, we fly out to Detroit. We are headed to the Midwest Fly Fishing Expo. Anybody that's up in the Michigan area, 
stop to stop over at the show. That is one of my favorite shows on the planet. And I'll tell you, those guys treat us like a million bucks. We get picked up, taking the breakfast, taking the lunch, get a big basket in our room when we show up, plus a new shirt. It, it's awesome. These guys are first class. I cannot wait to get there. Um, they always have a good crowd, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Performance flies. Uh, I just bought yesterday a fish pond fly tying case. Can't wait to get it. It's going to be on my doorstep tomorrow. Just bought it from Kevin Compton and uh, didn't even know that he sold that stuff, but I am so excited because I can keep all of my fly tying stuff organized now. If you saw me, if you ever see me at any of the shows, I carry around about 4,000 Ziploc bags with, with all of my stuff in it, and uh, I'm so excited to act. I'm going to really look professional with this, with this new bag that I got. But performance flies, you get free shipping. Anything that you buy from Kevin Compton, I think the last pattern I tied, I, just about everything I tied out of it um, was, was something from Kevin. Great, great materials, great hooks. Um, I will never go back to the old hooks that I used to use. I am sold on these uh, pulling mill hooks and the dohikus. The barbless hooks make a huge difference uh, in fish mortality. They're also uh, easy to get out, so you don't destroy your fly trying to get it out of a fish. And I'll tell you something, from the bottom of my heart, you do not miss as many fish with these hooks. They are almost like a circle hook. They are deadly sharp, and once a fish has that fly in its mouth, it doesn't get rid of it very easily. Um, so remember that, Performance Flies, www.performanceflies.com. And if you're a FaceTime member, you go to info at performanceflies.com, and Kevin will give you a code so that when you purchase your, your items on his website, you automatically get the free shipping. So check it out. It's, it's, it's a, a great deal. Kevin has got great stuff. If you're not a member of FaceTime, www.ericstroutflyfishing.com. Uh, two videos per week. That's per week, $10 a month all instructional, and it looks like uh, everybody's excited about this class idea. I'm excited. I promise you I will put it together and have some details next week for it. Um, I think it's a great idea, too. I would also be able to uh, probably get some video into that, so looking forward to it. Stay in touch with me through the week, folks. Um, I'm sure we'll get lots of comments. The vast majority of, of people that listen to, to our program listen through the week at some point. So please send your opinions along to me. I could literally probably do three or four shows on this subject. As I was putting my notes together for this, I thought, boy, there's so much to cover here. I'm going to sort of jump around and, and, and hit a lot of different areas. And I probably missed a few points that I'd like to make. But... Um, <clears throat> Let me know your thoughts, uh, and we will continue this discussion. It's going to be very, very relevant in a few weeks. We are not far away from spring. I suspect next week I will probably have some, some video with uh, bluing olives. Spring is just about here. I can't believe it. But let me know your thoughts on this, and we can continue. We can go down this road. I would like to show you some video of different rise forms uh, with with also showing you the trout, where they're at in the water column. So I think we can uh, do a lot of good things, educational things, and we can both learn a ton. So I can't wait to actually have the video camera out during these hatches, and uh, it's going to be hard for me not to fish, but I'm going to really focus on, on the bugs and the trout. So obviously I'm going to have to fish a little bit. Just so I can maintain my sanity. But stay in touch with me, folks. Thanks so much for being a part of the program today. Our numbers continue to get better and better, and I thank you for that. Uh, we're having so much fun doing this. If you're not a member of FaceTime, join today. Any questions, give me a call, 814-505-4568. Until next week, good fishing.